next on News Channel 15 at 6. A 14 year old boy who was accused of shooting at a school resource officer could be tried as an adult. We'll take a look at his background. A Twitter page spells out plans to attack this school and left many wondering why no one reported it. And South Carolina wants to jam prisoners' cell phone calls, what the state is doing to get the feds to sign off on the plan. Good evening, I'm Tim McGinnis. And I'm Allison Floyd. As you can tell, we are broadcasting tonight from a temporary set at our News Channel 15 studio in Conway as we have begun construction on a new set and a new look. We'll have more on that in just a few minutes. But first tonight, the 14-year-old who police say shot at a school resource officer yesterday at Sacristy High School could face an attempted murder charge. The solicitor's office will ask the court to try the juvenile as an adult. News Channel 15's Joel Allen is in Sacristy tonight with more on the consequences facing the young man. Joel. Tim Allison, the school's principal, says it appears that this young man was thinking about this incident, planning it for quite a long time. And if he is found guilty of the many charges that may be filed against him, he could end up in prison for a very long time. The potential charges facing the 14 year old accused in the Sacristy shooting could put him in prison for the rest of his life. Those charges start with attempted murder and possession of bomb making materials, and now there's a potential third charge. The use of a bomb as a terroristic threat, that sort of thing, and that carries from um, 25 to life. So there's some pretty serious charges out there. At a waiver hearing expected to take place Friday, the solicitor's office will ask a judge to move the 14 year old to adult court based on several factors. His age, the seriousness of the charges that are leveled against him, and uh, there would also be some psychological reports, probably competency type things. The school's principal says the student's prior record give no indication that he was capable of violence. Our administrators did not know him, uh, and for an early arriving ninth grader, that's probably a good thing. Browning says it appears, based on entries on the juvenile's Twitter page, that he had a well thought out plan, and there is no evidence that any other students were involved in it. But there are indications other students knew about the boy's intentions and did not come forward. And that's a major concern for the principal, who says he hopes the incident serves as a life lesson for other students. I'm hoping that they will, they, they will understand that their lack of action may have changed someone's life. Because there were so many students in the school at the time, the deputy solicitor says there could have been actually six to seven hundred different attempted murder charges filed against this young man based on the bombs that were found, uh, police say, in the school and also the bomb parts found at his home. But the deputy solicitor says at this point they are just focusing on that school resource officer who was slightly wounded by shrapnel in that shooting yesterday. Tim, back to you. All right, thanks a lot, Joel. Security measures were heightened at Sacristy High School today in the wake of that shooting. Metal detectors were in use when students returned this morning. Expensive machines may help bring about the feeling of safety, but as one school official told News Channel 15's Holly Morgan today, technology alone is not enough. Yesterday was an exhausting experience for, for a lot of us and a very disturbing experience for, for the school family here at Sacristy. <laughs> Today was a different story. <laughs> Heightened security helped smooth things over in the wake of Tuesday's on campus shooting. I need you to open that for me. Bags were searched. Stay with your stuff. Students funneled through metal detectors. Go ahead, guys. They're an important tool and a part of a school's safety plan. But these devices were just one of many steps taken to make sure students felt safe. Police were first to arrive, then teachers showed up, and students started funneling in an hour later. Yeah. Tuesday, metal detectors weren't in use at Sacristy High, causing many parents to ask, why not? Why now? School spokeswoman Teal Britton says the amount of personnel and time needed to run 1,400 students through metal detectors makes it virtually impossible to do every day. And she says... And if they had been set up yesterday, it doesn't mean that the, that the suspect in question could not have gotten that weapon onto campus in, in some other kind of way. The detectors also get students talking, and when it comes to avoiding a crisis like Tuesday's shooting, communication is key. This Twitter page has students and the community talking now. It contains messages that warned of Tuesday's events, but so far it appears no one who read the post came forward. The best defense that a school has is for its own student body to be able to and to have the courage to tell an adult when something isn't, isn't right. 
because there's not one element that promises safety and security without any compromise. In Saucesty, Holly Morgan, News Channel 15. And tonight we are still waiting to hear how many kids showed up to school today and how many did not and just how long it took them to get through the metal detectors. More police officers will be on campus throughout this week. Students tell News Channel 15 that because of the extra security measures, it did take a while for their day to even begin. And while the mood was tense, they still had a good day. It was pretty uptight when we got there, but eventually it turned into a normal day. Uh, we all got searched this morning and uh, there was the metal te uh, detectors were set up. So. so if you think about it, today it would have been like the most safest time to come because they had all the precautions and stuff. The school did a really, really good job and they kept us safe and they did a really, really good job yesterday. And just a few hours ago, students were released from Socastee High School after their first full day since the shooting. The hot topic for many was a Twitter page that many say belongs to the suspect. The tweets on that page say the poster had pipe bombs and was planning an attack. News Channel 15's Lisa Edge continues our live team coverage. Lisa. Well, Tim and Allison, we need to point out that Horry County Police have confirmed that they are investigating a Twitter account page, but they have not said which one it is. Now, the page that we believe that belongs to the suspect had about 50 followers yesterday, and now that number has tripled and continues to go up. Now, one of the tweets says, quote, Things are going great. Should have six or eight pipe bombs and four Molotov cocktails soon. In quote. Now we spoke with a number of students today and now they all seem to be aware of this page in question. Now the students we talk with say they are surprised none of the followers of the Twitter page before the incident incident told the school officials or police. They all say they would have turned him in or at least try to talk to him about what was happening in his life. He's talking about guns and bombs and blowing things up, and that's just not right. He should know better than to do something like that. But if I knew him and stuff, I would say something to him, trying to, like, make sure he's okay and make sure he doesn't do something like that. Now, there are about 1,400 students who attend school here at Socastee High, and the principal tells us that they can't be big brother to all of them. So it's in particularly in situations like this that they rely heavily on student input on situations and to look for them, to come to them, um, to notify them in situations like this. We're live in Horry County, Lisa Edge, News Channel 15. All right, thanks, Lisa. Of course, we will continue to follow this story and have more for you on News Channel 15 at 11 and on your website, carolinalive.com. A judge set bond today for the man accused of a possible hate crime. Chase McClary is charged with assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature. Last month, Florence County deputies say McClary hit the 16-year-old with a mug, and when the mug broke, he continued to cut the boy with the pieces. Deputies say he yelled racial slurs at the African-American teen while he attacked him. A judge set his bond at $100,000 if he's released. The judge has told him he's not allowed to post anything about the case on social networking sites. The judge says he's already discussed it on Facebook. We had another really nice day across the eastern Carolinas. First alert, Chief Meteorologist Ed Piotrowski joins us to tell us if things are going to cool down as we head into fall. Ed? Uh, not anytime soon, that's for sure. We're expecting the hot weather to continue right on through the end of the week. We'll start things out with a look at the satellite and Doppler radar review. We have some showers and a few storms in the upstate of South Carolina and western North Carolina. But for us, high and dry today, and we will remain that way tonight right on through the end of the week. Temperature-wise, we are generally in the upper 80s to around 90 again this afternoon inland, generally in the low 80s down by the beaches. Your forecast for the Grand Strand goes like this for the rest of the night. We're expecting mostly clear skies with an overnight low near 70. There could be some patchy fog in a few spots. Meanwhile, inland, we're expecting temperatures to fall into the mid 80s by 7, mid 70s by 10. Overnight lows generally in the mid 60s. And yes, the humidity is up and is going to stay up for the next couple of days. But there are still decent chances of rain late in the weekend and into the early part of next week. I'll have the details in the seven day forecast, plus a look at the tropics coming up later on. All right, Ed, thank you. Corrections officers last year confiscated nearly 2,000 cell phones smuggled into South Carolina prisons, and they say those cell phones are being used to commit crimes outside prison walls. State officials continue to press federal regulators to block cell phone signals inside prisons. News Channel 15's Tanya Brown's in our Florence newsroom to tell us how they plan to do it. Tanya? Tim and Allison, the governor and corrections officials held a news conference today in Columbia to put pressure on the FCC. A corrections officer who police say nearly lost his life in a hit planned with a smuggled cell phone says the FCC can learn a lot from his story. 
57-year-old Robert Johnson has a story to tell. It's just been a time. The 15-year veteran officer was shot six times at his Sumter home last March. Police tell me the attack was planned by an inmate with a smuggled phone. Kicked my door in, uh, yelling police, and I was in the back room. So I came running out to see what was going on, and I see this man standing there with a weapon in his hand. At a news conference in Columbia Wednesday, he stood with Governor Mark Sanford and corrections officials urging federal regulators to grant the Corrections Department's petition to jam cell phone signals behind bars. We don't want another Captain Johnson. I'm not so sure that... Sometimes I get the feeling the folks in Washington really don't care. The Corrections Department director says the FCC has taken no action on two petitions he filed in the past two years to block cell phone signals in prisons. Robert Johnson believes he would still be working and in great health had the FCC acted two years ago. I would not be the way I am with this cane, with my shirt out, and facing some more major surgeries. I would not have been this way because the inmate could not have orchestrated the hit that he did without that cell phone. Federal regulators fear jamming the signals will interfere with emergency communications and legal cell phone use in areas near prisons. Live in the Florence Newsroom, Tim Allison, back to you. Tanya, thank you very much. Corrections officials say other countries allow jamming cell phone signals with no interference on outside users. As we mentioned at the top of the newscast, as I'm sure you've noticed, we're on a temporary set tonight. And we will be on this set for several weeks as construction gets going on our new set and our new look, which we'll share with you next month. This is video of that old set that was shot this morning just before demolition. The crew started taking it apart. And over the next few weeks, we'll keep you updated on the progress of the new set. We do ask that you bear with us as we work from the temporary location here in our Conway studios. And that old set... I'd been anchoring on since 1996. Wow. We, of course, had it renovated a little bit when we moved to Conway in 2002. But uh, kind of sad to see it go, but very, very excited about the new set. And I know that there are some pieces of that old set in your office <laughs> That's right. right now. I was actually <laughs> climbing in a dumpster this afternoon, <laughs> pulling them back out. But, well, uh, you do that often yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's right. So, okay. Dumpster diving for uh, pieces. There, there's the dumpster there I was it is. in. Well, we're very excited about this. Yes. And uh, so next month, get ready for the new look. This is News Channel 15 at 6 with Allison Floyd, Tim McGinnis, First Alert Chief Meteorologist Ed Piotrowski, and Sports Director Rich Brandpanis. Coming up next. Things are looking up for a PD Fire Department. We'll tell you how a new leader is bringing the volunteers back. And there's a new way of warning you when a fire danger is high. Those stories and more are coming up on News Channel 15 at 6.